Thank you so much for joining. I know it is Friday afternoon and it has been a long week and everyone is probably uh, tired and full of ideas and inspiration and whatnot from the past few days. So I really appreciate you all making the time and space to be here for this session. Um, I wanna start with just a little bit of a check-in and for folks that are here, um, just type into your jack, uh, to, to, to the chat box, how is your heart today? How is your heart right now? Start with the check-in. Okay. I don't think folks are using the chat function or maybe I just can't see it. Um, but in any case, please, uh, please do check in with yourself. I know there is a lot going on in our families, in our communities, in our work, um, and in the world right now. And so I hope in this session we can really connect our personal reflections over the last year and in the present moment and what is going on in the world and um, in our work for smarter and equitable cities. So. I want to just talk a little bit about today's session and what we are going to be covering. So my name is Panthea Lee. I am the executive director of Reboot and also affiliated with a few other organizations, including People Powered, The Laundromat Project, the RSA, and the Center for Science and Imagination at Arizona State U University. And I'm really excited to be guiding you all through the session today. Um, and I think this one is going to be a little bit different in terms of how we typically think about strategy and about impact. I know you have a lot of content sessions already, really focused on the technical content and ideas and following linear ways of thinking. And this I wanna offer is also a content session, but perhaps in a slightly different way. Um, because I think you know, theory and, intellect and, and, and intellectualization is helpful, but only to an extent. It can also be a distancing technique um, and too much of it can actually be toxic or lead us down paths that um, perhaps are not that helpful for what we're trying to accomplish because it can pull us away from the concrete um, and the fundamental and into series of increasing abstraction. Abstraction that is only accessible to those with inside knowledge of the technical topics that we're talking about with advanced degrees. And so in this session, we are really going to be talking about strategy and impact in perhaps different ways. Um, just a bit, of con uh, a, a bit of context on myself so that you can understand where I'm coming from. So I was born in Taiwan, my family immigrated to Canada when I was six, um, and I've been in the US now for about 12 years. And I came to the US because so much of my work was in the majority world or you know, what we commonly known as global south, developing nations. And I came to the US because I recognized that so many of the decisions, the ideas, the innovations here had so much impact on my communities in the rest of the world. And so I really wanted to be here and see how it all happened as it were. Um, and you know, once I arrived here, I recognized that there's a lot of issues and a lot of challenges that um, very much sort of spoke to my heart um, in the communities that I found myself in. And so my, my, my work today is a mix of global and domestic work here. And I often find myself nowadays as a facilitator and a mediator working at the intersection of community groups, of activists and of governments, um, and really looking at issues of open government, civic technology, smart cities. Um, and, I, and, I, and I approach this work as I would say a critical friend. I speak tech, but I also think a lot about the human factors, the interpersonal factors, the trust factors that enable or hinder us from being able to advance the promise and the visions that we all strive for. Um, and I'm currently based on Muncie Lenape land, um, which is also currently known as Brooklyn, New York. And so for this session, I invite you to turn off your emails and sort of join us um, in this conversation and to open your mind and heart uh, for the next, I guess, hour or so. You're invited to take what resonates with you and leave the rest. Um, and despite hopping, I'm not super familiar with this, but I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat and also, um, and let me know if there's any issues with viewing the slides. I think this is the only presentation format that where I can see both. Um, so apologies. Um, 
So first I'd like just for us to start with about five minutes of um, grounding actually. Um, there's been a lot of you know, buzzing ideas and frameworks and things that we wanna do and to-do lists and emails. And I want us to put that aside for a minute. So if it feels comfortable for you, I'd like you to actually sit back and find a comfortable seat that you can sit in and be well in, in the next uh, five minutes. And if it feels safe and accessible to you, to first, I invite you to close your eyes and to put your feet on the ground and to sit back and to feel your tailbone grounded to the chair or to the seat, wherever you are. And I invite you to find your breath. I'd like you to breathe in deeply through your nose and exhale through your mouth, focusing on the sound of your breath and the bodily sensations of breathing. And I invite you to stay with that to notice and to use your breathing to focus you and to help you slow down your body. Because there's nothing you need to think up for the next few minutes. No emails, no schedules, no errands. You're just here. For, for folks that are just joining us, we're doing a little bit of grounding. And so I invite you to find a comfortable seat for a few minutes and close your eyes. in through the nose and out through the mouth. Now, imagine that you are a tree. You are standing in an open field with the sun shining down upon you. You are tall, strong, and solid. You are old and wise. Now I want you to bring awareness to your spine and to your back. And notice how strong and straight it is. This is your core. And this is the backbone of your tree. I want you to also bring awareness to your feet and to notice them in contact with the ground. They are firmly anchored to the ground. Now imagine strong roots extending from the bottom of your feet and pushing down through the surface of the floor, reaching down through the building to the earth, going down beneath the soil and feel these roots extending down, down, down deeper into the earth, winding around the rocks and pushing through the many layers of cool, dark earth. Your roots are growing and spreading downward and outward. And you're feeling yourself anchored very solidly to the ground by this extensive root system. Your roots eventually reach the core of the earth and wrap around its core. Now with each exhale, I want you to push excess or unwanted energy down out of your feet and through these root, roots into the, the surrounding soil. And feel the tension and the stress draining from your jaw, your shoulders, your chest, your legs, and all the areas of your body. And notice how the earth is receptive and simply absorbs all of this for you. Feel how the earth receives your energy and feel grateful and lighter as you begin to clear. Now, I want us to take a deep breath and start reversing this process. We are now going to re replenish the energy we have discharged down and think about drawing the earth's grounding energy upwards. As you sit straighter and feel yourself 
getting taller and taller and the earth's life energy coursing through you, reaching up through your roots into your legs, through your core and up into your head and into the tree's branches now reaching out of your head and towards the sky and towards the bright warm sun. And feel how good that feels. And now take in the earth's energy through your spine and up towards the sky. And as you now breathe, imagine with each breath that through the branches and through the roots, you are absorbing white light. You're feeling the nutrients of our earth and of our sky being absorbed and slowing down your own internal root system, your nervous system, till it reaches the trunk of your body. And we'll just send a few breaths, feeling this earthly energy wash over us. Feel the sun shining down on our tree body and know that with each ray of sunshine and earth energy we're, we are receiving, it's giving us the ability to, to create our own energy within us. And now step back from yourself and witness yourself and witness the tree and see how you are one with the earth and one with the sky, solid and steady and expansive. And just take a mental note of how you feel right now. And if there's anything that you want to carry forward into the next hour as we have this conversation. Please take one last deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth and open your eyes gently. Check in with the room, check in with how you are and thank you for giving yourself to that exercise right now. So, thank you. So the session is um, a little strange is in that, um, thank you, Anthony. And I can now, I, I found the chat, so sorry for missing your responses earlier, but it's nice to see the range of feelings and emotions that everyone's sort of bringing in uh, to this Friday, midday or afternoon, to, depending on where you are. Um, this session is a little bit strange in that I cannot see you all, but you can see me. And usually I like to run these in ways that I can see everybody. And so um, if you would like to join the conversation at any time, please, I think you can raise your hand in the Hopin platform. And um, one of my colleagues will be able to bring you in through the back end. And so this is intended to be a workshop, not a presentation, but um, so Let's, let's do what we can through the chat and th also through the format to bring folks in. Um, and so first I'd like to start with a check-in on a series of questions just to um, check in with one another and how we are entering this topic. So um, my colleagues are going to put together um, three polls for us right now um, around these questions and um, for us to be able to respond. Um, very happy that folks are being grounded and relaxed. Um, so the first question I want us, the first of three questions I would like us to think about is how would we characterize, how would you characterize your mental and emotional health and well-being since the start of the pandemic and through today? So let's just wait for a minute. Um, oh, I think the polls are ready. So if you just click over to the poll, let's, um, and just reflect on this question. How would you characterize your mental and emotional health since the start of the pandemic through today? Okay. Oh, I can see the responses now. Okay. 
so no one's feeling fantastic. Um, and we have a small intimate group today. So, you know, I think some folks are feeling good, some bad. Um, and yes, please do put on all three polls. Um, thank you, Grace. Um, and then we, yeah, so no one's feeling fantastic and we're sort of uh, neutral. I don't know, it's all a lot veering on sort of bad, terrible. Um, so it's a spread. Okay. The second question is, how would you characterize, actually, and just on the first question, would folks be able to, um, in the chat, just type in why you selected the answer that, that, that you selected? What is impacting your mental and emotional health? And feel free to come on camera if you would like to speak. What is impacting your mental emotional health? Servicing needs. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Is it Jaitanya? Feel free to come on video if you would like. Or I'll interpret that as perhaps we are all having a lot of different folks' needs that we need to service and attend to. Yeah, so many challenges I think we're all facing through learning about all the experiences and grief and trauma and burdens that we're carrying and trying to understand what we can do about these as humans, as family members, as employees, as community members, um, you know, gosh, um, all my empathy and solidarity with working mothers. It's been so challenging and difficult to stay on track with everything um, shifting in our world while we tend to our loved ones and our families. And absolutely, um, the, the racial and the gender disparities through the pandemic has been, I think, devastating. Um, and very rightly upsetting for many. Um, and Jay, Tanya, would you like to, um, yes, join us in sharing your experience? You hear me, I am fooling around with my settings. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, it was a systemically underserved area uh, that was further stress tested by COVID and so it just pretty much deepened some chasms. So um, the needs were already there. Mm -hmm. There are just more of them. And while there are infusions of, of cash and services, um, trying to rapidly deploy those, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a good stress, not a bad stress, but it's a little stressful. I mean, good stress, not bad stress, but it's still absolutely stressful. Thank you for, for sharing that um, and for joining. It was good to see you. Yeah, so we're all grappling with it. Um, and then I guess just related then to um, what I, I, I hope you're, I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Jaitanya was saying, the second poll question is, how would you characterize your satisfaction with work since the start of the pandemic through today? How would you characterize? Yeah, keeping up with constant change and working to balance emotional ability and service demands. It's been so hard. Um, so the second question is, how would you characterize your satisfaction with work? Um, and if folks want to also put in the chat or want to come on um, to speak to this. So it's a mix of, it's mix of good and bad, what I'm seeing. More good, um, okay, that's fantastic. And while you're at it, feel free to also um, just answer the third question. How easy or difficult have you found it to set strategy and drive impact in this period? Okay. 
I mean, basically for folks, it seems like, you know, so work actually, people have had relatively good work satisfaction, but at the same time have also found it um, difficult and challenging to set strategy and impact. Okay, some folks, I would love to, whoever is uh, straightforward and seamless. Um, that has not been my experience. And so I'm just very happy for you and also happy for um, other folks that are, that are really, um, yeah, finding energy and motivation and inspiration in this moment. But I think for most folks here, it seems to have been challenging and a struggle. Okay, um, got it. So I'm gonna keep an eye on the chat, but you know, I think what has been challenging is coming up sort of um, in the chat and in, um, and if I were to characterize, it seems like it's been a lot of, you know, folks, um, we love our purpose and those that we serve, um, but yeah, connecting and synchronizing the work is a challenge. Um, many of us have big demands. We're seeing openings for greater justice and equity and infusion of resources and whatnot, but also we have family and friends and community to attend to. And it's also difficult to understand how to pivot um, and how to um, work in this moment, both with the pandemic, as I think with the um, reckonings we're having as a society. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, um, there's certainly a lot, lot of need and perhaps not enough resources and not enough knowing how to bring communities together to tackle them effectively. Um, and so the, the, the inquiries and invitations I want us to process over the next um, 45 minutes or so is how do we process the collective grief and turmoil of the last year? I think Herman was talking about um, you know, organizing a Zoom memorial for a close friend. And I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about your friend. And there's so much, I think, grief and trauma that we're all carrying and processing, but haven't necessarily had space to release. Um, how do we set strategies then when also so much still seems unpredictable with the Delta variant now? And I think a lot of talk around, um, with a lot of talk around long crises, and this is just the first in a series of shocks we are going to experience. What does that mean for how we set strategy when so much is in flux? And then I think a question that many of us are grappling with is how do we evolve our understanding of what impact is to be able to incorporate what we have learned about power and privilege and equity and justice in the last year? You know, these concepts are not new. And at the same time, I think the conversations that have erupted rightly in the country and in the world in the last year have um, have really sort of led to some sort of hard reckonings um, in our workplaces and our communities around how we best serve um, these values with the structures and systems that we have that aren't always um, don't always rebalance power, acknowledge privilege, drive equity um, as much as we can. And. I just want to raise up, I'm not sure how many folks were at the last Smart City Summit in 2019, but I noted that when I was looking through the summary from that session or from that gathering, there were many key barriers and, un and unresolved questions that I've heard time and again with governments, international agencies, community groups, um, and these seem to still be from, um, and, and, and these still seem present with us two years later. And these are a lot of questions around trust. How do we build trust with users and communities? There's lack of internal trust within city government. Stakeholders lack procedural trust. What is fair and what, um, what can enable or break trust as we're piloting, trying new things um, and whatnot? And I think that these questions of trust um, are very much top of mind for certainly the communities that I work with as an organizer, um, as a facilitator, as a practitioner. And I think in the last year, the mass uprisings and protests that we've seen have pointed to actually a lack of trust from citizens um, in institutions of power, whether they be sort of large NGOs, um, we're seeing a reckoning in the nonprofit sector, in government and whatnot. And so what does that mean for how we set strategy moving forward? And I want to acknowledge this and then also just offer some observations to, um, to f from what I have seen in the last year that I think can help us um, ground how we think about strategy and pivoting and trust building in such an uh, uncertain time. So for the next little bit, I'll be going through um, a bit more sort of presentation style, but I will also be keeping an eye on the chat. 
Um, so please. Um, so I think the question that I want us to start with is what happens when everything breaks down? Because that's certainly what it's felt like in the last year. And I want to start by pointing us to this um, quote from Arundhati Roy, the writer, which many of you may have seen last year because it started getting quoted everywhere. Um, she wrote this fantastic piece called The Pandemic as a Portal in the Financial Times. And one of the last closing lines was, historically, pandemics has, have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And I think at the time, many of us looked to history, looked to the present, and really seized this as a rallying cry, really seized pandemic as a portal. Um, you know, uh, the Spanish flu brought about socialized medicine, um, not in the US, but in much of the world. And early last, um, or sort of about in about mid, mid spring and summer last year, we saw a lot of these headlines. Um, you know, we were suddenly housing the homeless. We were giving uh, refugees rights. We were um, we were adopting donut economic, environmentally sustainable models of development and growth. And I think many of us thought that this would carry forward, you know, um, and these policies that lead to a more just and equitable world would carry forward. And I think the jury is still out on whether or not um, these these reforms will, will will hold. And that's something I want to make space and time for. But I want to um, just ground this in a concrete experience first, and which is bring you to my community of Bed-Stuy here in, um, in what's currently known as Brooklyn, New York. It is a really vibrant, wonderful community. Um, we are known for our famous summer block parties. Um, and I acknowledge, you know, I am a settler colonizer on this land and a gentrifier in this neighborhood, um, something I'm actively, you know, working to understand how I can best support the community that I find myself in and now love. And at the start of COVID, um, our numbers here were bad. We were not doing very well. We we're sort of the central part of Brooklyn um, that you might see here. And um, the numbers weren't the worst, but they were they were pretty bad. And it was a time when I was speaking with city agencies, with nonprofits, with UN agencies around what we do both here um, in Brooklyn and also around the world. And a lot of the meetings that I was in, like I'm sure many of the meetings that you were in, were not moving at the rate that and um, at the type, at the scale and type of conversation that I thought was necessary to, um, to address this rapidly um, exploding crisis. And so at the time I started, um, organizing with a community here. Um, and the group that sprung up started by a brilliant writer um, named Sarah Matthews is called bed -Stuy Strong. And Sarah went out, put some, um, put some flyers all around uh, bed -Stuy, set up a website, set up a Slack group. And within about a week, there were maybe a thousand folks that had signed on. Um, and, you know, this is a mutual aid effort that we have, like many we have seen, all around the country in your communities and cities as well. But I want to point to something around bed -Stuy Strong that I think is really remarkable. Very quickly, um, this mutual aid group set up one of the most sophisticated um, ticket tracking and CRM systems that I have seen. And I've worked on a lot of uh, public and civic programs. And if you, you know, um, I've, I've, I've blurred out the parts that are, um, you know, personally identifiable information or sensitive, but really just to give you a sense of the back end that was built within, I think, like two weeks time. So this is um, the system to deal with neighbor food and medicines and supply requests. And um, for those that are, oops, for those that are interested, this is the back end. Um, this is the back end that was put together. So you can see that it was really sort of um, cobbled together from a series of, you know, accessible um, tech platforms, um, you know, com commercial tech platforms that we're all familiar with. And the community um, did this work, you know, uh, through. We just um, took a break. And um, but, you know, really hardcore did this work for about a year. And it was really remarkable to see because you can take a look at some of the stats right here. Um, over to, in about a year, there are about 6000 neighbors that signed up to help their neighbors, um, delivered groceries, medicines, essential supplies to about 10 percent of the population here in bed -Stuy, largely focusing on the elderly um, folks that are financially struggling and the immunocompromised. 
we raised over $1 million for the community fund um, from about a thousand individuals. And while it started with um, food delivery and sort of uh, food services for those um, sort of struggling, it led to other campaigns around community cleanups, clothing swaps, election support, books, booking vaccine appointments, um, and letter writing to community members that were imprisoned. And so it's really sort of spawned into this incredible effort. And this is, of course, not just here in bed -Stuy. it's happening all over the country and the world. I know there are folks here from Charlotte, uh, from Philadelphia, from Miami. And I think we're seeing all these examples of communities coming together um, and around the world. Uh, this is, I was talking to an amazing group from Chile. You know, these are groups in the Philippines and folks were just coming together in times of crisis to help one another. Um, and love that Jaitanya also worked on a similar effort, right? We've all been, you know, we all wear our professional hats, but then there are also all these community efforts that we are engaged in or know about or benefiting from. And what really struck me at this time, and, you know, for reference, my background is as an ethnographer, um, but what was, what, what struck me at this time, it was really, con it, the, the contrast to what I was seeing, quote unquote, at the top was incredibly stark because my nights and weekends work was, you know, taking phone calls, dropping off groceries, whatnot. And my nine to five was with, um, you know, different government agencies, different international agencies. And it was really challenging because I think amongst the highest levels of government, we were seeing denial, blame, unwillingness to face the facts, um, unwillingness to accept science, incompetent responses. Early on, we saw, you know, basically the hunger games of PPP um, unfolding across the country. And what that means is it really handicaps civil service and partners. Um, and I saw a really, you know, you would hope in times of crisis, like with mutual aid, folks would band together and do the right thing. And what I ended up seeing, and I'd be curious about your experience as well, is that internal politics deepened, um, existing fragilities were highlighted and exacerbated, and there became almost an even deeper mistrust of outsiders or what folks would refer to as amateur change makers and an unwillingness to open up and collaborate. And I thought that this was really dangerous because mistrust goes both ways and it's a self-reinforcing loop. And this is one of the key themes of the 2019 Smart Cities, um, Smart Cities Lab. And I think it has even deepened as we know um, this year and you know the consequences of that are massive, um, as we're now seeing around our political debates, around vaccines and masks and conspiracy theories and whatnot. And these are things that, you know, as you know, civil servants, as practitioners, we have to grapple with. And I saw basically sort of this tension between what um, in government and in big institutions, we also see often, you know, described as old power values and then new power values emerging in movement organizations, in community groups, whatnot. Um, this is from Jeremy Hyman's and Henry Tim's, their new power book, um, which is fantastic. And just for a moment here, I'll, this is a table that I made um, last year when I was observing the differences between the uh, the government and the institution, pro the institutional sort of programs that I was part of and supporting, and then the community efforts that I was part of and supporting. And I'm not going to go through this entire table here, but I do think that there are, I, but I think it's interesting to note that the operational orientation is very different. We spend a lot of time assessing and then planning and commissioning studies and trying to find the data and then doing. And I think there are good and right questions right now being asked about, is the data valid? What are the biases? What, you know, um, is, is the basis upon which we're making decisions, the valid ones, or do they actually exacerbate in, in, in inequities? Um, and we were producing a lot of briefings and data models and papers and whatnot, while the community orgs that I saw were, you know, mobilizing very quickly to meet essential needs. And this is not blanket across the board, but I did see um, in terms of approach to collaborating with one another, um, you know, I think in governments, I saw a lot of fear. I saw a lot of, well, we want, we, we know we need support. We can't do um, last mile outreach. We need different types of resources, but what if they see how messy we are behind the scenes? Um, and I think, um, and so I think I, I found a lot of this really challenging and as did the community groups that I saw because, um, you know, certainly in a lot of smaller community efforts, I, 
you know, I would say, well, hey, I know foundations that are providing support or I know, you know, um, folks in government that could help us with this or that or the other. And it was immediately kind of, no, we do not trust institutions. We do not trust governments. We are going to do this ourselves. Um, and this is obviously a problematic dynamic because each is good at a different thing. And it's led folks, um, this is Ori Okolo, a really, you know, well-known inspiring activist and philanthropist um, in, 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 in Kenya um, who tweeted last year, what is a government? And these were the types of responses that she got. Organized violence, um, an amorphous body re resulting from coalescing interests, the strongest, most organized gang in a territory, a business, and do we even need one? Now, as someone who works with governments, this is obviously very distressing to me, but it recalls um, this famous line from Reagan, the most terrifying words in the English language are, I am from the government and I am here to help. And I think what the pandemic has forced us to do in this era of massive uncertainty is really challenge our notions of, yeah, what a government is and where do some of our assumptions around how they should be structured, what their role is, their relation in uh, their their role in relation to community, where it comes from? And I think a lot of our no mo modern notions um, really come. Uh, I, I, you know, I think in political theory we trace it back to Thomas Hobbes writing the Leviathan um, after the English Civil War, where he basically assumed that left to our own devices, men would descend upon a war of man upon man. And therefore, we need government to um, prevent us from falling into our worst, you know, kind of beastly instincts and to um, provide the infrastructure and um, the, the, the resources to, to, um, for us to live sort of healthy, productive, satisfying lives. And this now, I think the infrastructure that we've seen is, I, I think there's good questions about what government is good at and should be doing and what it is not. And, um, and I think also these justifications have been used for state overreach, um, authoritarianism, whatnot, but that's perhaps a separate conversation. Because I think that what the pandemic did show is human nature is not vile and terrible. We're actually really altruistic and want to help each other. This book by Rebecca Solnit last year, I think sold incredibly well, um, A Paradise Built, Built in Hell, I believe it was written a few years ago. I'm not sure if folks have read it, but she basically surveys um, a history of disasters and how communities respond. And she shows through through history that, you know, left to our own devices, we are caring and loving and altruistic and want to help one another. And we can be nimble and fast and quick and resourceful in ways that government cannot um, because of, you know, the very nature of the systems and infrastructure that we have set up for good reason. Um, and so I want to come back then to this question of trust and of collaboration in strategy setting. The strategist or the emergent strategist, Adrian Marie Brown, um, who's brilliant, has, you know, has a saying, trust the people and they become trustworthy. And last year and even today, I see a lot of fear of opening up and fear of working with community groups. And um, and because also we, 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 we do get a lot of criticism. Um, I think, you know, we talk about, let's bring startup culture here. Let's fail fast and fail forward. Well, in government, that's really hard. You can't take taxpayer dollars and fail forward in this media environment. So I get it. The stakes are high. It makes it really impossible to open up. And at the same time, I think we have to. We have to find ways to do it, um, and 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 I and I really want to talk about um, what that looks like because there's such great value in the do assess plan, what we can learn from communities and how fast they move and how they set strategy um, based on they have the ability to fail, they have the ability to try, and then can we take their lessons and planning into what we do and sort of help scale up these efforts or help learn from these efforts, I think that's going to be an essential part about how we continue to respond to these compounding long crises um, and these shocks that are going to continue to be with us. And so that begs the question of what does all of this mean for our shared future? And I think in so much of my work um, in open government, civic tech, smart cities, I think you know, we've talked about wanting to understand communities and citizens um, through the lens of empathy. 
you know, being trained in design, I was taught that empathy is the be all end all. If we just, you know, empathy, if we just develop empathy, that begets good solutions. But I think what we have seen, um, so yeah, ran workshops, whatnot, you know, figuring out how do we do ethnography, create personas like this, and then design services and products that can serve these folks. But the art historian, Aruna D'Souza, had, um, I heard her talk once and it completely changed my view on empathy. She says, I don't want to wait for people to develop empathy for me until I am treated as a full human being. Because a politics based on empathy imagines justice as something to be bestowed by newly enlightened individuals on other lesser individuals and communities. A politics of empathy allows those called upon to be empathetic, to remain in a position of supremacy, doling out justice as a matter of kindness. And when I heard her say that, something really clicked for me because I realized that in many cases, the folks that I was asking to be empathetic came from certain backgrounds, were of certain life experience that were very different from the folks. And no matter that the folks that they were serving, you know, we talk about marginalized communities, historically oppressed communities, but the folks that I was working with were not from these backgrounds. And I can make all the user personas and journeys and systems diagrams and whatnot that I, that, that, that I want, but it's really hard to, it's near impossible to sort of really be in someone's shoes in that way. And so, you know, what do we do then? Um, empathy will not save us. We need structural justice in a different way. And I think that requires grappling with history and power and context and ethics and equity, all things that we typically avoid in the civic tech space, that we avoid in strategy and technical planning sessions. And I think this is why so many folks from marginalized communities, from historically oppressed communities are kind of done. They're saying, you know, we're done with the effectiveness and the efficiency and the reform. Because the problem with reform is that reforms have often rendered the institutions themselves more permanent. And so in the last year, we've seen people are tired taking matters into their own hands, mistrusting government. And I don't think this is tenable. Um, I think I think I, I have participated in these activities um, and these protests and these marches. Um, and I deeply understand where the frustration and anger comes from. And at the same time, I think that we need to um, seize the opportunities presented by the pandemic, by a upheaval pandemic as a portal and think about systems change and how we actually um, bring all of us together to do so. Now, systems change requires all of us, but the kind of rules that we have um, typically assigned ourselves and assigned others I think are too idealistic and they're simplistic and even naive. You know, we say governments um, are gonna create policies and deliver service to serve the people. Companies will then sort of produce goods um, and services and the activists are just here sort of protesting. The artists are just, you know, over there imagining. It doesn't really sort of tie to what it is that we're doing. And I think we need to be much more integrated and we also need to evolve our roles. Um, and I think we have to change ourselves. So companies, yes, produce goods and services, but also what does it mean to do it in ethical, equitable, inclusive, sustainable ways? For governments, you know, how do we protect against harmful biases um, that are in our data, in our technology, and how do we protect against corrupting interests? And for activists, I would offer, you know, yes, we need to protest unjust systems, but we also need to help define paths to dismantling them call out culture and cancel culture right now started for good reasons, but I think is, um, is, is, is really challenging our notions and our ability to come together and work together. And I get it, it's really hard. Um, you know, we have all these questions. How do we bring the right actors to the table? How do we overcome mistrust and fear and inertia? What does it mean to agree on a common vision when we all come from such different backgrounds and how do we move from past talk and into action? Um, these are all right questions to be asking, and yet it is essential because we are all good at different things. Um, you know, the companies that we belong to, the governments um, we work for, we have great powers of production and distribution capacity. We have resources, scale and durability that my small mutual aid group, many of the sort of organizing collectives, you know, we do not have that. 
Um, but I think activists are able to bring a moral clarity and, 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 and courage that is not always welcome in the institutions that we work with. We, we, have, to, we have to soft pedal often what we say. We have to co uh, cloak it in um, technocratic language. Artists can bring radical imaginations and push us to think bigger. And I think there are ways that we need to um, harness all of these as we set strategy and redefine impact for ourselves so that it's not just um, set by those with power that, you know, really are looking at, you know, companies, how do companies assess impact and value? I mean, profits. We can argue, you know, triple bottom line and all that, but at the end of the day, it is profit. Governments are often looking at number of people served, and I know there's much more nuance to that, and you know, but we, we are often in counting exercises. And so how do we actually harness the power of all of these um, superpowers in setting strategy and driving impact? And I don't think it's utopian. Um, my country where I come from, um, not to you know, beat on it, but, but I think Taiwan has done an, a really incredible job. Um, you know, we can talk about that in discussion if it's helpful. Taiwan has done a really incredible job, but also um, through COVID, but also because we are internationally, we don't have support. We can't rely on the international system um, uh, through obviously geopolitics with China. And so we had to really just lean on ourselves and find ways to work together. And I think that, you know, we recognize that so many of the systems and structures that we've inherited enable and sustain injustice, inequity, and oppression. And they were designed, and we know that, and we're having that reckoning right now. But futures that honor and protect justice, equity, and liberation can also be designed. And I think the way to think about it is co-creation is often thought about as throw a bunch of people into a room and magic happens. And that is so not the case. We know that because there are power dynamics at play. We um, often, you know, to get communities, uh, for communities to have attention for their issues, resources, we often ask them to perform their trauma in ways that then re-traumatize them. Um, and so we cannot just throw a bunch of people together um, and expect you know, strategy to happen. I think we need to think about who should be asking what question at what point in time. And I don't know about you, but for me, I wanna be looking to our artists, to our poets, to our activists, to answer the questions of what our future should look like. And then I want to work with academics and grassroots groups that are already doing pioneering work in generous, agile, and creative ways to define paths, you know, whether operational paths, legislative, fiscal, administrative, to realize this vision. And then I think the role of governments and, 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 and companies should be, you know, to set policies um, and organize markets to realize this future, um, leveraging what we're really good at and not necessarily letting the um, the shackles of bureaucracy constrain our imaginations and not being able to sort of set the most courageous, um, equitable, inclusive visions um, that we can. And so I offer this just as a way to think about what our role is because, you know, um, and, and, and how we work with groups in different ways. And so what I want to then um, offer now is just a bit of a discussion for us around these four questions you know, what are the fundamental assumptions or biases in our space? And I know folks come from slightly different but adjacent backgrounds that we must challenge. What is getting us, what is getting in the way of us being able to examine and challenge and reframe these assumptions or biases, whether it's about our role, about whether and how we work with communities around trust. What is the role that I as an individual can play from where I am today to fight for more meaningful impact and progress? And finally, how and where can I challenge notions of impact and urgency? So my work serves the scale and the complexity of the challenges that we face, because I, I get it. You know, oftentimes we have this mandate. We are sort of in our box here doing what we can. But I think that we can also think about our work and our life um, taking a portfolio approach. You know, what is the 10 percent that is going to be more radical, more courageous, um, more pushing the envelope? What is the 50 percent that's experimental and new, but relatively safe? And what's the, you know, however you want to think about it. But um, where and how are there these strategic lever uh, leverage points uh, to do more um, justice oriented work um, and also more collaborative work um, to leverage and harness the strengths of the communities that we work with? So. These are some observations and reflections that I have had. And um, I have some backup slides if we wanna uh, talk through these. But for now, I would just focus on these questions and invite 
you all to uh, type in the chat or really I would love for folks to come on the screen. I think we can have more than one person at, at a time, but to you know, think about whatever landed for you, what resonates with you and bring your own reflections. What resonated? What didn't? Are there questions we want to ask of each other? Sure, okay. Hi. Hi, Herman. <laughs> nice can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. All right. Yeah, I, I thought this was very good. So just a brief uh, background. I mean, I, I'm not in the media world, but I, I do consume it a lot. So one of my nonprofit boards is arts-based projects. So we're based here in Minneapolis. We are the nation's largest developer of affordable living workspace for artists. Mm. We're in 26 states. We have $800 million in real estate. Okay. So, so what we, so I mean, you know, affordability, obviously, in the arts world is going to be always like an issue, yes. but we're helping the artists and we're working with, you know, city, local uh, and state, you know, uh, you know, governmental agencies, as well as housing authorities, you know, mm -hmm. the whole 360 degrees of a housing mm -hmm. to make it work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think that's one, and it's been around, this organization has been around for like 25 years. So, okay. so I think it, it's a way to like keep affordability for the creatives uh, mm. still, you know, actually still going. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Herman. That, that, that's really fascinating. Um, what's the name of the organization again? I think I missed that. Oh, so it's called Art Space Projects, Inc. And Art Space in, Yeah. Okay. And it's based in... Um, um minneapolis okay fantastic thank you for sharing that um and i'd be curious you know how are you all then thinking about setting strategy or you know oh. impact in this time and because i also um what i find fascinating about um you know i'm, I'm no expert in mm -hmm. housing um but a lot of my friends that work on housing and land issues i'm seeing some really exciting conversations right now around um more and more mainstream than I've seen on issues of land back right. and reparations and looking at you know sort of bigger you know things that might seem out of out, um, impossible right now but I think we're, we're we're starting to have these conversations you know you see city councils debating it uh, yeah uh, curious um, what you're seeing uh, right quickly I would say one thing is uh, we we are we are doing more work on reservations now uh, which is very like it's a very tricky thing because you have you know uh title to land et cetera et cetera and but more uh more of the reservations are coming up to do housing or like to do uh buildings or or facilities where they need to congregate and home you know and like have people um the second thing is we are um there's, a, there's an increasing demand for what is called work for, workforce housing so basically building affordable mm -hmm. spaces for people who are working and it's similar to what the artists have, but there's a workforce need for affordable housing. So we're starting to move in that direction as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much and thank you for, for, for your work. But you, um, well, 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 thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to, um, and feel free to stay on um, if other folks want to oh, jump on oh, I'm sorry. the video. No, 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 please. I'm, I'm, oh, just, oh, just stay on. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm always like, why don't we all jump on? But because I can't yeah, see yeah, I, have to going. Yeah. I also don't know if folks want to. Um, so feel free to stay on or jump off as you as you like. Um, but I, I just wanted to touch on the question from um, Arena. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, which is, I appreciate what you said about not just throwing people a room with existing power dynamics. Um, have you seen different methods or modalities are effective at disrupting this aspect? Um, yeah, uh, so I'm a I'm a facilitator, mediator um, with an ethnography and a design background. So I think a lot about sort of human dynamics and power dynamics. 
and um, I'll offer a few ideas um, and then, you know, happy to also take it offline as well. Um, but basically, you know, what I often see is when we come into a room together, we often are coming with our titles and our organizations. And, you know, these are very clear way that we're signaling power and distance um, and whatnot, like, you know, from the get go. And I often just at a, at a very sort of basic, in a very basic way, don't want any of that. I just want your name. I don't want to know who else you are and, you know, what fancy things that you do. And I, and I think, so that's just one way. Um, I often, I like to know who everybody is, um, which is not always possible if you're like, let's say it's a 200 person gathering. But I like to know sort of who folks are, what the interests are, because everyone, you're not co-creating on a blank slate. Everyone's coming in with their agenda, their bias, their whatnot. And so I like to sort of understand what the politics and the mindsets are for folks coming in and where they're trying to go on that chessboard, you know, so sort of as a facilitator, map out the chessboard for myself before everyone is coming in. And then to be able to, um, uh, for folks, especially that that are bringing their experts, um, our living experts bring lived experience um, or come from backgrounds that, you know, can tend to be more challenging to talk about, more emotional to talk about. I try and do that work for them. Um, and so at the outset of, the, of a gathering, for example, I might show slides or take a survey or whatnot so that they, they don't have to stand up in front of a room of folks and be like, these are, these are my challenges, these are my problems, whatnot, but still to center their experience and to center the challenges um, in a way that is undeniable, we can't look away. Um, and that I think is powerful and affirming. Um, and then I think some of it is just facilitation around who you call on to speak, how you, you know, um, who you call on to speak, um, how you frame and guide exercises. I find visual exercises or different ways of engaging is much often better than just having folks talk because let's face it, nowadays workshop participation is a skill. You have to know how to like write on the post-it, say the thing in a 10, you know, 15 second sound bite so that everyone gets it. And many folks are not used to that. Um, ethnographic studies show of people coming to like community board meetings and whatnot. Folks from um, less privileged socioeconomic backgrounds, um, from backgrounds um, where, you know, where they're uh, like racialized people, they tend to, um, sometimes they'll go and then they'll actually walk away less civically engaged. They won't go back because they realize the space is not for me the way that these people talk, the way that these people present. And so I think there's, yeah, there's a bunch of things, but those are some that come to mind. I'm not sure if you wanna um, add anything. It's nice to see your face. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, no, I think all of those things I agree with and I've seen versions of attempts at that, like successes at that, and then that's not present at all. So I think all of those things are important. And then I think the thing I've seen the most and is the biggest challenge is you see that behavior like constantly surfacing as a facilitator. And it probably takes a long time to get that skill where you can start to reroute the behavior and continually create that equalizing conversation. Mm -hmm. It's it just yeah. it's an ongoing thing and such an important aspect to this. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I'm not sure how many folks here tend to facilitate as well. I think you have to do a lot of like internal work, well, you know, to be able to show yeah. up as a facilitator in that way. Um, I know for me, like my own experiences, um, I tend to, I had to like really confront how I interact with, um, you know, like men that are older, that are white, that look a certain way, you know, based on sort of my background and my upbringing and how I was sort of culturally conditioned. And I need to like learn how to like stand my ground um, for folks that are, you know, in, tra in, in traditional positions of power. So that was certainly something that I needed to um, grapple with. And so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really hard as a facilitator in all sorts of ways. <laughs> yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah, agree. Yeah, um, that really resonates. Hi. Hi there, Susie. Thanks for joining us. Oh yeah, I, I wanted to say quickly. So I, I have uh, my background is um, having done you know you know uh, facilitation and then hiring facilitation uh, people. I mean, I worked at Northwest Wells Fargo twenty four years of corporate market research. So I hired a lot of people, right? And we mm -hmm. worked in a lot of different areas, but I'm also on a lot of different boards all over the place. So I think mm -hmm. that's really 
uh, it's really important to, that that the skills that we bring to those meetings yeah. are, are, are really good and important because uh, yeah. I think people need uh, and organizations need to you know have this ability to have someone facilitate making sure that they're on the right track and then what are you going to yeah. do in terms Absolutely. of that, yeah. you know? thank yeah. you Herman yeah, Appreciate yeah. That. sure yeah. you're welcome Susie hi Don uh, Susie did 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 you want to share a, a, a reflection, a question, a challenge? I just had one question that I put in the chat about, you know, where do we find this this kind of updated facilitation training? Because it, it's changed dramatically over a relatively short period of time. And yeah. I feel like more and more, I work with a nonprofit organization and we're being asked to facilitate these kind of conversations because we're often mm -hmm. sort of in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so wondering how we can do a good job of that and where we might find those resources. That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm constantly trying to like uh, challenge my own assumptions and beliefs and like, you know, reskill and unlearn and relearn and all that. Um, you know, I would say um, groups that I've found helpful, just um, a few that come to mind and I can drop these in the chat as well. Uh, I've actually gone back to mediation training. And so there is a uh, mediation, Mediators Without Borders, I think, offers some training, um, but I've also been um, doing work with the Social Justice Mediation Institute run by Leah Wing and uh, Deepika Maria. And um, Generative Somatics also offers training, but from like an embodied perspective. How do we embody justice and how do we, you know, um, work with folks from very different backgrounds? And so Generative Somatics, um, um, I haven't done their trainings, but I think they've um, they've been. Um, I I I, just, I I really admire their work, and I hope to do a training with them. And then I I also know the Wildfire Project. I'm not sure if they offer trainings, um, but they um, not sure if they offer trainings, but they're a group that I've heard great things about too, in terms of how they facilitate and guide organizations through these messy questions at the intersection of like institutional impact and also like personal growth. Um, because I think in so many of our organizations or movements or whatnot, we're not dealing with the personal stuff and the conflict that is sort of impacting us from like resolving conflict successfully and, you know, um, and moving forward. And I think um, as I've been part of, you know, a, like a circle of mediators um, that's thinking about how to challenge white supremacy culture, you know, like one of the characteristics is conflict avoidance. And I think we're all, you know, whatever race you are, we all suffer from that, you know? So what does it mean to then reskill and challenge and whatnot. So um, those are some that come to mind. And then uh, my, my organization, Reboot, we also do um, training and support for folks that are doing more uh, co-creation co work. How do you bring people from very, very different disciplines and backgrounds? Um, so that comes to mind. And I think Jennifer had mentioned um, deep canvassing. I, I, I know this might be the type of facilitation, but um, there's a great organization called Movement School and also Momentum, but Movement School came out of um, the Justice Democrats. And I think, yeah, they um, they would be sort of, you know, my go-tos in terms of, you know, deep canvassing, um, organizing work and yeah. So I, 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 I hope that was helpful. And thanks, Jennifer. You know, I, I would think the other important part and the title of the presentation is also demonstrating impact. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really also critical. I mean, the end user, whoever you serve, would want to know right. what's, like, what's the impact. Right. People who, who like fund you, who like give you money, uh, right. you know, they're, they're going to want to know as well. Well, just quickly on that, and then um, thank you, Herman. Quickly on yeah. that, and then I want to move to Don or others, feel free to jump in. But something I think I'm noticing now, too, is um, philanthropy is having a reckoning, you know, um, around, I think that, um, I'm not sure if there's night folks here, but you know, um, one of the nonprofits that I um, that I'm on the board of, we just got um, we were thrilled to be able to get um, Mackenzie Scott's generous support, and you know the modality um, and the way that she sort of you know provided that support kind of just opened up our imagination. You know, we're an arts organization that centers BIPOC voices and works with artists and communities to make change. So the type of support that she gave and kind of the impact indicators, I trust you. <laughs> You know, and I think um, there's an administrator, a former administrator of USAID, Andrew Natsios, 
who when reflecting on his agency, I think after he retired, um, had said, you know, something to, I'm gonna bungle it, but something to the effect that the most transformative change is often the least measurable. And like, you know, and the least measure, measure or the most minute change is what we tend to like track and measure, you know? And he described USAID as a bean counting agency basically by the end of his tenure. Um, and so I think that there's all good conversations right now. We're having that monitoring, evaluation, learning, whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think the reckoning is, uh, is interesting. I'm interested to see where we net out. Um, Don, thank you for joining us. I'm really enjoying this conversation a lot. Um, and I'm still sort of struck and reeling from those, uh, quotes you put up about how people feel about government. Mm. Um, and just really realizing like 50 years of discrediting government has really worked and that it's like the last place that young people look to for structural change. Um, right. And I think it's really ultimately the only place that real structural change is gonna happen. Um, and that part of our task is to like change that conversation about what government can do and who it belongs to and um, what what the whole public realm means and reclaiming uh, it. Absolutely, yeah, I think, um, absolutely. I, I think mean, there's- Schools have been trashed, public housing, public, I mean, everything. Right, right, the right. Uh, yeah. And this idea that like philanthropy is gonna come in and save all of that, um, I think, is part of that reckoning you're talking about of like mm, they've had 50 years to do it and it's not really working right and also like why is there so much money there and how do taxes work on that <laughs> you know like we're asking all the questions and um, how is that avoiding structural change in a big way right and now as we have you know um i think i read something like bezos in like a day or two makes the entire budget he's like he's like profit is like the entire budget of the city of Philadelphia or something like annual budget in like a day or two. And I just like, that kind of like blew my mind, like watching them like go to space and like cowboy hats. You're like, um, but, but to this, you know, I think that, I think there's really interesting. Yeah. I think we've done so much work to discredit government. And I also think like, you know, you look at our media systems now um, and just all the yelling at, like, I really feel for public servants you know, and you want to try things and it's really difficult and everyone's yelling at you. And um, so, you know, Adrienne Marie Brown, who I mentioned, she also wrote this great recent book, We Will Not Cancel Us. Um, and I thought it was, it's a tiny booklet, it's fantastic. Um, but I think there's great groups also, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with them too. Some of them might be Knight grantees or partners, um, but I think like um, Code for America, of course, does like the sort of, you know, embedding within government, um, I think Fuse Corp, you know, I, I think it's like folks that are trying to re-engage people and saying government is a place that you need to work, or like, you know, we, we need to invest in government, we need to, you know, um, I think Justice Democrats, I think their model is really interesting, you know, bringing, um, uh, you know, electing people that are actually representative of their constituents, um, you know, into Congress. I think, you know, AOC was their most sort of, you know, kind of like, most well-known sort of progressive win, but you know, now it's Cori Bush, Jamal Bowman. Um, and I think that, but here's the thing too, I think something that we need to think about too is, yeah, but then how do we change the, the like structures and the bureaucracies and the sort of the, 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 like the culture issues that, you know, there's so many things that we need to tackle to make government an attractive place to work rather than just a tour of duty that you do on a fellowship, right? Um, and I could, because I think for many peers I know, that's how many folks think of it. And, you know, the reason that that mutual aid example, why that system was so good, I realized that many of the folks that were building these, they were engineers and they were data scientists and they were folks at private corporations that we could not afford to hire in government. They stood that up in a week and it was so sophisticated and worked so well. Um, but yeah, we would struggle to get and keep that kind of talent in government as well. And so, um, you know, this is not my area of deep expertise, but um, yeah, I, I totally hear what you're saying. And yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would I would also briefly say that uh, people have to also get more involved with the government in terms of learning about the government, particularly from the artist side, the community activist side, 
Now I've served on panels for the NA National Endowment for the Arts for like over 12 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, uh, and I just recently served on two panels for the CARES Act. I mean, it's mm -hmm. really gut wrenching as we know. I mean, this is really serious, but I think artists, and I'm an artist myself, a curator, et cetera, the ones who I talk to, but they really don't want to like knock on the door of going to the state or the federal, you know, the day they think that somehow that's not their job. Right. And, um, but it is their job. It's, it's like everybody's job. It's hard. So I think we have to get um, sort of more facile at how do we communicate to people that it is your job to knock on the door of government and to give them feedback. Right, right. Absolutely. And we've for a long time told people, you know, I think what's, um, as an immigrant here, I think what's always been kind of crazy to me about America is the amount of energy and money spent during election cycles where everyone like educates themselves and gets involved. And, and then as soon as it's over, it's like, psh, the energy dissipates. And you're like, where, how can I find you all to do other things that I need? And, you know, um, so I absolutely agree. And I think also like the media system here um, and everywhere now, but, you know, I think we, we told people for a long time government is showing uh, like you know d democracy your duty as a citizen is to show up every four years and vote um and then other than that you pay attention to the kardashians or rat and angelina or whatever like we got it we're good you know and um so i'm fascinated herman with your like arts and cultural organizing background because i'm like how do we actually um how do we change that narrative um and uh yeah how do we change that narrative how do we get people engaged in a different way and how do we build that cultural momentum for civic engagement, so. Yeah, you're very welcome. And I think, uh, you know, forums like this that the Knight the, you know, Foundation offering like like is really important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We, we lost your video, Panthea. Oh, can you see me? No. Oh, <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening, um, but okay. I also think actually our time is probably up. Um, right. I think, think you'll have few minutes until um, the last closing session. Um, so. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining, for your um, insights and contributions. I really appreciate it. And yeah, thank you for joining. All right. You know, you know, great session. Thank you. All right. All right. Take care.